Welcome, everyone. My name is David Affariot. I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Trade Ideas, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to welcome you today. Um, I want to give thanks to our host and sponsor, well, our host, Del Frisco uh, Grill, and our sponsor, Interactive Brokers, represented by Craig Rose. Um, and so I'm going to be, this hour, this hour or so that we have in time together is going to be a presentation on some fintech trends as well as some trends in uh, client relationships. And I'm very proud to have as a, a co-speaker, uh, Hugh Massey. Hugh. Hugh's in uh, the same group as I am at the Entrepreneurs Organization here in Atlanta. And we got one more straggler in here. Hi, Brad. Welcome. Over here, Brad. Hi, Brad. So we'll, we'll get right into it. Um, I want to introduce Hugh Massey. As I said, he's the CEO and president of DNA Behavior, uh, which is a, essentially a, a firm that does behavioral finance in the, in the service of cl uh, clients and how, excuse me, of advisors and how they represent their clients in uh, fashioning information to make sure that uh, communications are clear and they, that relationship between advisor and client is always uh, at, at its maximum efficiency. So without further ado, we'll, we'll kick off with a Hugh's presentation, followed by a presentation on trade ideas. I'm also joined, I want to make, point out a couple of people here that are going to help in that process. Uh, the first is Thomas Marks, uh, who is an advisor of trade ideas and also uh, works for IFS Securities, and he'll introduce himself a bit later. And Andy Lindloff, who's a director of our customer support and education at trade ideas, and who's come from uh, Texas to, to join us today. So thank you both. And Hugh, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, David. It's great to be here with all of you today. Um, and uh, David, thank you so much for organizing this and uh, having the vision to do it. And Craig, thank you for, uh, for uh, uh, sponsoring us and allowing us to, uh, to get together and talk about really the yin and the yang of uh, wealth management and, and investing. Because as David said, I'm going to talk about uh, human behavior, and David's going to talk about some investing strategies. And what we both deal with at the end of the day is strategies and techniques to deal with human emotion. And we've also got uh, in our audience Daniel Crosby, who's also very well known in the field of behavioral finance, and there's some others here that, 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 that I know as well. And uh, you know, this is a whole area that's, that's really emerged. And you know, what, what does get in the way of investor success is, is human emotions. And so that's what I'm going to talk about from, from the behavioral side. I've been doing this quite a while. Uh, I'm a, actually as a, a reformed accountant uh, originally. I'm not, a, I'm not a psychologist, although once I uh, stepped out of the accounting world and built a uh, successful financial services business myself in Australia, um, and I still have a funds management business there. I realized what was getting in the way for, for most people was, was their human emotions. And you know, my purpose with this is to help people at the end of the day become more financially self-empowered by understanding who they are, but also to help the advisors out as well. And uh, the way I look at uh, investing and portfolios is it is uh, a portfolio of decisions rather than positions. So, you know, to bring that to life, often when you uh, meet a new client, they'll, they'll show you what they've got, and they've got their 30, 40, 50, sometimes 100 uh, positions. I've seen all of it from, with people from, you know, half a million dollars of wealth to a billion dollars of wealth. And a lot of the time, those investment decisions reflect who they are. They reflect their behavioral biases. And if we're to help that person uh, grow in the future, we need them to understand what those biases are uh, and, and, uh, and then learn to manage around those. So in financial planning today, uh, in today's world, it's a lot more focused on goals-based uh, uh, planning. How do we help a client achieve their goals? The part that I deal with is uh, not only the goals-based planning part, because that is important, but it's the human emotions that get in the way of someone achieving their goals. And markets and life goes up and down over periods of time, and all of us react differently to those life and market events. 
And what I want you to be able to, un you know, what I seek to do with our financial DNA solution is to help you get a, a, a prediction up front of how people will behave in those up and down markets. So I'm going to show you our technology solution today for discovering human behaviour and how you can work with that uh, in a holistic wealth management uh, platform and then how that ties into uh, what David's doing uh, around uh, investing and with an algorithmic uh, strategy. So what do clients use our solution for? To improve the advisor-client communication. If that is broken, everything's broken. And that is the same between husbands and, husbands and wives and within, and within the family. Right? Uh, how do you set quality life goals? So what is a person's motivations for setting their goals? That is actually a reflection of who they are as a person. So we deal with that. Then the investment decision making. So looking at uh, the risk tolerance, looking at the behavioural biases uh, that get in the way of making good decisions. And uh, you know, an area, this is also, and it's not in the blue circles there, but on the, on the bottom left there is compliance and minimising com complaints. And, and so, you know, we're using our systems now with some, with some very large firms where it's been embedded into the compliance management uh, processes. Uh, not only, you know, so, so we're meeting two goals, improving client engagement, the productivity of the advisor with the client, but also reducing compliance risks. And, and then there's a lot of, we do a lot of family dynamics work uh, with wealthier families and helping them understand their differences and sorting out uh, what the issues might be that get in the way of wealth creation and, pr and protecting the wealth. When I started this journey on human behaviour, remember I was an accountant originally, I had this theory that uh, when people are under pressure, they would revert to this natural hardwired behaviour. They would go back to the animal instincts and that's what takes over. And I was lucky enough to have two psychologists, one in Australia and one, in, one here in Atlanta, uh, who confirmed that, that idea to me and that theory to me. And really what you often see when you meet a new client is the masked behaviour versus what's going on underneath. And if I use an example with that, uh, when I, in about 2005, when I was in the early days of this, I, I had a new client called Frank Butler. And Frank was 39 years old, he had a wife and three children, and he just sold his, sold his stake in a technology business. He was one of five partners. And he said to me, I, Hugh, I don't want to take any risk with my money. I thought, this is odd, because you're a founder of a, a technology business, you're an entrepreneur, and you don't want to take any risk with your money. What I found out was that his parents went bankrupt when he was eight years old. And he said, I am a risk taker, but I don't want to, at this stage, I don't want to take risk with my money. But that was a very important learning lesson for me because what I found out was his natural instinctive behaviour was to take risks. But his conscious thinking right now was not to take risks. And I had to deal with that all the way through the financial planning cycle, and we still do. Because he's still a little nervous at taking risks with money, but he's always asking, where are the returns? And all of you in this room uh, know what, what I'm getting at here. And so I have, to, I have to, uh, to manage his emotions all the way through to feel, for him to feel protected. But at the same time, I've got to communicate to him, well, we've invested you a little bit more cautiously than who you are. And this is why you're not getting the returns that get generated. And so that was a conversation. And um, it's always a conversation. And it's a conversation with... Ah, now it's moving. It's a conversation with every client. And so what I want to know is, up front, what are the conversations I'm going to have with each client because each client's unique. And when I say client, it's, it's, it, it, it's uh, the husband and the wife and potentially with the children. And what we do is we get the clients, every client uh, that works with us or, uh, and their financial advisors, go through the financial DNA discovery process. This is an online process. It takes 10 to 12 minutes to do online. Uh, 46 questions are completed. We do have one with 12 questions. It's very quick and slick, and you're going to get all this robust information I'm going to talk to you about uh, in a minute. And this is how I learned that Frank was really a risk taker and how I was going to have to relate to him. But, but, but the other side, what came out of the conversations was his desire for caution. Um, and we have this information uh, in, in varying levels of complexity in terms of the reports from one page reports so that you just get this in uh, five key items that you need to discuss with a client to 
uh, very detailed reports if you really want to become uh, a more of a coach to, to, to the client. Uh, but, all the, but all the data's there. But what we're focused on is this natural instinctive behaviour. Not the learned socialised behaviour that you see when you first meet uh, a, new, a new client. So what's the type of information you get? Now this is very simplified um, and, not, and, and not all of it. But what I really wanted to highlight out of this is that uh, you get to see your clients in different styles. So for example, on that graph there, I am an initiator. And that means I'm a bit more goal driven, a bit more results driven. I'll take the risks in looking at my portfolio. I take a consolidated view. I have 10 positions, so long as one has made me 1,000%, I'm happy and all the rest can be losses. Because that's what, it, that's, that's what it is. Well, hopefully, if you learn what that means, actually, you will uh, not make so many dud decisions with the bad ones and um, you know, learn to focus improving your decision making rather than just accepting that losses are okay. Uh, some of us in the top right hand corner there are spenders. You want to know that. Some of us are going to follow the herd. They're the dinner party investor. Heard a great idea at lunch or at dinner and I'm sold and I'm going to jump into that. We like all the new shiny things. We're instinctive. We're not going to look at the details. Then others, like my wife, are a little bit more risk averse and loss averse. And there's been a lot of uh, you know, behavioural uh, research done on, on those areas and uh, you know, uh, Nobel, Nobel Prizes. But some of us are really averse to a loss. Some of us have regret when we make decisions. Some of us will sell the winners to get the gratification of a profit and hang on to all the losers. And, and, and that's just, it's behavioural. But we're all wired to do that at different degrees. And then, then of course, for, for all of you, you've got in the bottom left-hand corner, you've got, the, you've got the engineer type client. Now, I know a lot of financial advisors are very engaging people, want to move fast. And you can get the engineer and you've got to provide them all the research and all the details. They like to mentally account in their portfolio. They want to bucket it all up. It's just a different type of person. Nothing's right or wrong here. It's all about understanding who you are and how you're going to deal with these biases. And that's what we show you how to do. We do work with risk profiling. Um, so we have a risk profiler built into the system based on someone's natural hardwired behavior. And we look at two elements of risk specifically here. The risk propensity, will you jump off the cliff and take the risk versus your ability to live with the losses. And what I found is those behaviors can be quite different. And so I've still, I still know people out there who are crying because five and six years later because they took a risk, it didn't work out. And this can be a gap because they're emotionally wounded from taking the risks. Others won't take chances, but can, once they do take it, they can live with the consequences very well. So we found it very powerful to, you know, to work with those differences. Then we, we put everybody across seven groups, which is just used as a framework to help build that core portfolio and what element is going to go into cash uh, and, and you know, how wired up is uh, somebody to take a lot of risks. So I actually happen to be in group seven. So I'll jump off cliffs and you know, occasionally do wild things with money. Um, even though I may be a more reserved person and the people I work with don't know that I'm going to do that, but that's, that's how I work. The guy Frank that I mentioned before was a group six naturally. But his portfolio actually started out, 60% of it started out at group three so we got him comfortable. So we've worked him up to that natural hardwired behavior through a mentoring process. Um, you know, when we get to talking about uh, trade ideas later, uh, where the, you know, it's algorithmic based trading, that's going to be for a, a component of the portfolio where someone's prepared to take a little bit more risk. So from this graph, we can work out which clients are going to be more comfortable with that. And that's going to be the clients in five, six, and seven are going to be more, potentially more comfortable with that kind of trading strategy. But of course, we've got to have a client conversation. And what we do with, um, you know, how do you deal with risk? First thing is, and there are a lot of elements to, to, a, to a risk profile. It's not just a singular number. And we've broken it down into a number of components here. The first thing I want to know is, what risk is somebody taking in their portfolio right now? Where are they on the Richter scale as far as their portfolio is concerned? And often, most people are taking more risk in their portfolio than they should be. Then, the next one is, what is the risk need? How much risk do you need to take to achieve your goals? That is a financial calculation. It's not behavioural. 
What is your risk capacity? What is your ability to lose money and still achieve your goals and maintain your life? That is a financial calculation. Then we get into the behaviour. What is your natural instinctive behaviour to take risks? What is your learned behaviours to take risks? How much financial education have you had? So we then look at those elements and align them to the risk need and the risk capacity. It might be, if you're like me there, I'm a very high risk taker, but I actually don't need to take as much risk to achieve my goal. So why should I take those risks? That's the conversation you have with the advisor. And then you land the plane um, between the advisor and the client on what the ultimate risk profile will be, be for building the portfolio. And so the technology we work with does all of that. Um, now, I've talked a lot about emotion, you know, and, and managing emotion is first part is to help the client understand themselves. The advisors have emotions as well. They've got to understand themselves. Now, how do we bring this to the portfolios? And, and, you know, portfolios themselves have emotions in them. And one way of removing emotion completely out of a portfolio, because remember, emotions is really what is the difference between success and failure as far as investing is concerned. You could just have ETFs, right? But that's just going to be running along with the market. You can go into funds of varying styles. A lot of the funds out there, some will make money for a few years and then they lose money. They're not all performers. And I think some of you have begun to, begun to learn that and <coughs> ETFs have uh, increased. But the other way of driving out emotion out of the portfolio is an algorithmic based uh, portfolio uh, uh, techniques like Trade Ideas has. Okay? And so that, that, that can have a component in, in the portfolio to, to create the sizzle. And if done properly, you are going to outperform the market. If, 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 you know, and so that's really the strategy. And there are a number of ways to do it, but trade ideas have really uh, nutted that out with the algorithms. Um, and so the last thing we do, so just to wrap up uh, here, um, is in our system, which I think is a great tool for the advisors and the clients, we have uh, what's called the market move. So when you've completed your financial DNA, uh, you can uh, bring the, as the advisor, you can go back into our system and have a look at where are all your clients as far as the market is concerned today? So if the market's gone up a few percent, there'll be some of your clients that are exuberant and there'll be some who's starting to exhibit fear. And this is all depends on their style and, their, and what their biases are. If the market goes down, some will be fearful, others will say, gee, this is a great opportunity. I'm gonna buy with my ears pinned back. What we do is we can help you prioritize your client bases by understanding what the market mood is of every client, uh, and then you know, then we provide you the script of what to say to each client so that you can enhance the communication and relate to them on their terms and dealing with those same uh, market terms. We actually can help you assign which advisor or which person in your office is best calling up the client, particularly when there's a problem. Because you know, some clients don't want to just be called up and, and, and told that, uh, well, we know we made you 13% uh, last year, we've done a great job they're actually worried about the school fees and, and their daughter's got a problem, right? So, so, you know, this technology really makes it easy for all of you to deploy human behaviour without having to be a behavioural scientist. Uh, for those of you who have not completed financial DNA and you would like to know a little bit more about yourself and try it out before you deal with a client, go to our website at financialdna.com. There is a start a free trial tab there go through it and we'll show you all the tools and how all of this works for you and then work out how you can do that with your clients. Um, we've also got you know, quite a lot of books and resource centres, videos, there's, there's, there's tons of information so that you can learn about it. I'm just happy if you all embrace human behaviour and want to become a little bit better at understanding it, more aware of your clients and uh, put the, the client at the centre of the planning, help them mo remove their emotions. Uh, Dumb that, you know, dial that down, make them more confident, then, then you know, we're going to have a whole lot happier people out there uh, in the world and, and be more financially successful. So there I will stop. Yep. Um, David? Sure. Thank you, Hugh. If anyone has any questions, we've got some time. <laughs> Mike. We have a microphone, so in order to capture it, we'll Which make one? sure. Which that one or the? Yep. Yep. Just for the sake of the audio that we're recording, you, I may not sound like I'm amplified, but if you could speak into a microphone, that'll help our recording of the event. Um, so, if anybody else has any other questions? There'll be a time afterwards, after the second presentation, where 
uh, we can do a Q&A that's more, that's, that's more global. Okay. Handle a question. Uh, how do you handle a question uh, from a fairly f sophisticated client on counterparty risk? On which one? Counterparty risk. Counterparty risk. Like a la John Corzine. <laughs> so he's your client and he asked you about counterparty risk? Yes. That he's not prepared to take counterparty risk in a, in a, in a deal? Well, I'd probably you won't take any risk at all. I'm, I'm just asking you, do you, does your algorithm cover that? Yes, um, and if you, if you talk about the fact that one of the wealthiest clients that I ever dealt with was the most cautious. What? The most cautious. Oh, okay. Very successful entrepreneur, made a quarter of a billion dollars from his business, <coughs> and when it came to uh, investing, didn't want to take any, any, any risks he with the money. He knew too much. Hmm? He probably knew too much. <laughs> Possibly knew too much, or actually not enough about money. And that's the case with a lot of them. So investment, a lot of investors, investment education, the level of investment education rather than professional business education is very relevant. Um, and you'll see other entrepreneurs and people that are experienced in business who are risk takers, but they don't know much about money and they don't want to get into what they don't understand. So you'll see the dialing down there. Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you, Hugh. All right. Okay, so um, as I said before, my name is David Affariot. I'm a co-founder and uh, managing partner of Trade Ideas. Um, essentially what we do is market analytics. We help people make better decisions in the market. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the latest innovations that have really defined who we are over the last 18 months in launching uh, artificial intelligence uh, on the markets. So this is, take some notes from several presentations that I've given re recently in San Francisco, in New York, and elsewhere. Um, I'd like to start off with a quote from Larry Fink, who's the CEO of BlackRock. Trade Ideas has many competitors, but most of those competitors like BlackRock, like Renaissance Technologies, and like Point72 are funds who serve their fund investors, whereas Trade Ideas will serve, we offer our AI as a service. Anyone who subscribes to the, uh, to the service receives the analytics. But what Larry talks about in this quote is, the game has changed, the rules have changed. In order to seek out and find alpha in the market, the requirement to change up and create new tools is needed. Tools like artificial intelligence, like big data and quant modeling. And this is what they spend their time working on. This is also what we've spent our time working on as well. And it's part of an overall complete sea change or a new era that it's defined as by the, by the waves of innovation that have affected the market in previous decades. Uh, all the way from SOS bandits, decimalization, high frequency trading, and we are clearly in a new era of robo-advisement and artificial intelligence. I actually had a friend who kind of asked the question um, in an article that he wrote about where are all the cowboys? You know, where are the, the kind of aggressive, uh, on mass kind of trading behaviors in the markets because it's not in the current market, U.S. equity markets, right? We have a lot of volatility in the morning, relatively speaking, less than normal, and then it's a flat, calm sea for the rest of the day. And that's different than the way the market structure used to work as a smile curve where you had lots of volatility in the morning, lots in the, in the afternoon. The, the article kind of, his point is like, most of these cowboys have gone on to other asset classes, either private equity or even <coughs> cryptocurrencies. What's left is this passive investment monolithic uh, you know, ETF uh, vehicles that are in the market. And it's just a, a particular, er defining again the era that we're in. So what I want to talk to you about is I will show the technology, uh, mm -hmm. but I also want to talk a little bit more about this, this democratization of access to AI, the trade ideas, it's our mission that we're providing and then some of the metrics and the impact the technology has already had in its, uh, since its launch. Right, so uh, a lot of the people who come to Trade Ideas, and we service everyone from the self-directed investor to advisors and certain hedge funds that are smaller in cap who don't have the, the staff and the PhDs to kind of do this kind of modeling, is who we work with. And before they come to us, like Larry had said in his quote before, there's a 
access to data is everywhere. And that leaves everyone thinking often that there is so much data out there that it's a data avalanche, but they get the impression of standing in an information desert. There's no ability to take insight out of all this data that we're inundated with. So what we do is we try to bring out that information from a massive amount of data. The artificial intelligence that we employ and the machine learning that takes place requires an enormous amount of data. Data that we get from the markets and we supplement with additional data sets that we add into what the AI is optimizing and building each day. Okay. Let me jump into some of the metrics. This is year-to-date Q3 up until the end of September, the results of the portfolio that we run based on the trades that the artificial intelligence, a system that we call Holly, has made throughout the course of the year so far. So th our performance is 30%, the S&P uh, benchmarked is uh, 13%, the Dow Jones is 15, the Russell uh, at 20, and sorry, the Russell at nine and the, Dow and the NASDAQ composite at, uh, at 20. This is also a risk-off analysis. So there's two ways that we, that the artificial intelligence looks at its trades. One of them is a strict adherence to the trading plan that it puts out. That's our risk-off mode. And a risk-on is a little bit more dependent upon the market itself, whether it will take the trades for longer than its initial parameters. Uh, at Trade Ideas, we also, and this is available to anybody, if you come to the website and you sign up for our trade of the week every Monday in your inbox. This is our way of kind of marketing and, and building a funnel for our services and, and uh, feeding the interest that, uh, that's grown around our technology. We give you in your Monday inbox a trade of the week, which is formed from the artificial intelligence. And then we have a team of three or four Andes on that team that actually picks out of the four or five uh, which ones are the ones for the week that we publish. And so this has been the performance just up into, I actually don't have the Q3 results here, but this is the first half of the year and the results that we have. Uh, this is an eye chart, right? So some of these are, the takeaways are the losses are kept relatively small. What you receive in your inbox is a full trading plan. So it says at this entry price, the trade is live. This is our first projected price profit target where you would assess the position, take half, continue on, or get out completely. And then we also obviously have a stop loss. And then those are managed, the, the, the intent is that you manage these on your own. This is the full trading plan in order to help you with those guardrails and making a decision. So some of the skyscrapers on here are Weight Watchers, which has been amazing, um, Square, JS, JASO, and the like, right? So for our own, we, we obviously, you know, have metrics that run not only on the performance of Holly, but on our own business as well at Trade Ideas. And this is just a, a quick growth of our subscription since we launched the AI um, at the beginning of 2016, the effect that it's had on us. And this is just simple subscriptions that we, that we receive. Uh, this is not our entire revenue. Let me give you a brief kind of description of the 100,000 feet view of what we're doing with our machine learning and, and how the algorithm produces or how the, the machine learning produces a, a regime of algorithms for each day. So as I mentioned, it's a big data exercise and we require an enormous amounts of it. So we bring in data feeds that are structured and non-structured. So, and we'll take feeds that are non-structured and make them structured. For example, the structured data is the technicals and fundamentals of the market. The non-structured data feeds are things like social media, where we'll take in social media and understand what are the mention rates of everything from Apple, of, of every stock on the exchange. And we will benchmark those mention rates and, and be able to understand when are things being talked about specifically for each stock more than usual or less than usual. So for example, Apple's talked about a lot, but we know for Apple is today being Talk to, is, are people talking about Apple more than usual or less than usual? All the way down to what Weight Watchers might be talked about and the like. And please, by all means, feel free to continue to start eating. We'll have a lunch conversation here. Um, so to that, we create all these derived data points. Like we'll create our own average for every stock about the social media mention rate. We'll add it, that to our historical database and we'll build what we call base strategies. 
What the machine learning and the AI does is it takes these base strategies, these, and it will improve on them by adding indicators, by changing values, by combing through and finding if social media affects one particular algorithm to the positive, it will keep that indicator. If it doesn't, it gets rid of it. So it not only designs what, from our data feeds, what the right algorithm is and tests it, it'll also provide a trading plan associated with that algorithm. So for instance, there may be a particular algorithm that does not perform well in the morning, it only performs well in the afternoon, usually around the week before earnings. So that's, if that's what in fact it's optimized to have found, it won't produce out of this quantitative combine, this overnight, it won't produce that algorithm unless it happens to be in that time frame where it's ascending in performance based on the back testing it does overnight. So the process overnight is to build the scenario, the algorithm, and then build a trading plan that says these should be the profit targets for every idea and these should be the relative risk management associated with each of these ideas. And, and part of that trade plan optimization might be only trade this in the morning or only take every idea for this till the end of the day. The result is this daily regime of algorithms that get produced. Sometimes there are eight. Today I think there were six. Two of them are long, or excuse me, four of them are long and two of them are short. And it's, once it's produced that regime of algorithms, that's the lens that it watches the market for that day. And during the day, it's doing an analysis of the market to say how is the market performing relative to how the AI has prepared the algorithms for, that, for the day. So if the markets are very volatile, some of the algorithms will not produce an idea. And if it does, it goes into a mode that says either risk off, which is adhere strictly to the plan or even take risk off the table as you never let a profit turn into a loss. So it will go into modes that are, for instance, called profit save or it'll be in a risk on mode that it assesses to say this is a trending market, everything seems to be very good, you can hold these ideas even longer than the time frames and the profit targets mentioned. And that's how we capture alpha, right? So let me kind of bring this back to a real quick example. Um, how does, and this may, I may anticipate a question, how does the AI react to certain events like black swan events, like Brexit or the US presidential election, right? So. Um, we had this functioning and working during June of last year during Brexit. And Brexit occurred on a, a Thursday after the US markets closed. The markets opened on Friday, it was a bloodbath, it was a significant correction. And then everyone had the weekend as a circuit breaker to kind of relax or kind of process what had happened. And Monday everyone was still very, very anxious. So how does, given that kind of scenario, how does the AI react in, in, that, in that environment? Well, it had done its homework Thursday after the market closed in order to incorporate the last day's worth of information, adding it to its historical database and its backtesting capabilities. And it created for Friday a regime of algorithms that it thought, based on Thursday's close, would be the right set of algorithms. But it did not know what had happened given the vote and the result of that vote. So, Part of the machine learning that happened is that essentially on Friday, the system made no trades whatsoever. And that is actually a, a, a wonderful, it was a highlight, it was a moment where we knew that the system was following certain rules, and those rules are pretty simple. A machine learning AI system has got to understand when something is happening in the market for which it is not prepared. That's rule number one. And in consecutive order, it then goes into, if there's something that's happening I'm not prepared for, it goes into a mode that says do no harm to the portfolio and simply be comfortable in not making a trade. And then the third rule is if and only if it can then process what's happened as a new day, only make those trades that are opportunistic and go in places where people are still have, feel anxious about going, which is what it did on Monday. So on Monday it started trading after it had taken in Friday's tape and done its analysis and then come up on Monday with the, the daily regime of algorithms. Uh, and in, when you look at the performance from last year, you can start, we were above the benchmarks, but you can really start to see a separation after Brexit. Um, just looking at, again, the US presidential elections, 
the results were also a bit of a surprise or unexpected. And the date, which was a Tuesday, and so the day after, the system, Holly, did make trades on that Wednesday and suffered a small loss. But that's also part of the, the risk management and the purpose of the algorithms that it's working, is that it keeps losses small. And uh, there's really just, when anyone ever makes an investment or a trade, there are four outcomes, right? You can have a large loss, you can have a small loss, you can have a small win or a big win. Three of those scenarios you should be happy to live with. A small loss, a big win, and a small win. Just avoid that large losses and you've already placed yourself in a quadrant. You're giving yourself a 75% chance to succeed over the long run. And so what this system does is it, it abhors a large loss and it will not let itself do that <laughs> under any circumstances. Okay, so that's the view. What I'll do right now is I'm going to kind of switch gears for a moment and introduce again Andy, who's gonna come up and just show the technology and show a couple of trades that the, uh, some interesting charts. But we've got a question and let me get the mic. The microphone is right here, okay great. Go ahead, Han, Hakeem. Right, so it's, it's obviously different in it for every trade. The question is, how do you define a large loss? We don't get into the risk profiles, as Hugh was talking about, of the individual. We simply look at what is, what is a, we calculate as part of a natural stop where the trade has failed, where the idea in which we thought the, you know, the, where the algorithm thinks that there is a profit target, and that first stop loss where its assumptions for that move are now no longer apply. And so that's a kind of smart stop that we, that we add. It takes into account um, a number, and then it will also add the natural volatility of that particular stock. So if Apple moves quite a bit more than, let's say, Weight Watchers, it'll add what is Weight Watchers' natural volatility amount to a stop loss. And then that's essentially how it adjusts for a smart stop associated with every stock. Okay. So let me kind of turn this over and uh, let the, uh, I'm gonna stop here. I'm gonna pull up the technology. Or you can give him a microphone. No, that's good. All right guys, my name is uh, Andy and uh, I've been with Trade Ideas for about a year and a half now, but I'm not coming to you today and talk uh, as a Trade ideas representative. Well, I am, but I'm, I'm more important. What's more important to me is talk to you as a trader. I'm a professional trader for 20 years, uh, trading out of my own account. I started with one of the very first users of this software. I'm user number 40 in the system. So if you have any questions when we're done here, you can ask me anything about the software and I can pretty much tell you about it. Um, I uh, worked over in China for about a year helping other traders. I was contracted as a mentor over there, about 450 traders. I taught them uh, techniques in day trading and active swing trading. Uh, I've also was with Ditto Trade about seven years ago, a company that started up and what it allowed to do was clients would come in and actually attach their trades to mine and my partners and uh, pretty much get the same entry and the same exit. It was a great technology. Unfortunately, they didn't have the money to do marketing. But uh, anyway, we outperformed the, uh, the S&P benchmark by 38% over three and a half years. So I've been really successful trading and that's what I want to talk to you about because I did it with this product. Uh, I always tell people, you know, you not only have to know how to trade, you need to know what to trade. And that's what this product does. And it's, the AI is great, this, what he was showing you, it's incredible, but there's so much more to trade ideas than just artificial intelligence. You can use this to find, to custom build alerts and scans to fit your parameters, whatever you're looking for, and we actually work with you and we'll help you do that. We will do one hour of just personal cons consultation and build you a layout. So real quickly, I'm gonna, sh I'm gonna show, because I don't have a whole lot of time here, but I want to show one of my favorite um, uh, scanners. Or actually, it's an alert that I use. And uh, uh, this is what I call my extreme volume high-low probe. 
Now what I'm looking for, I'm a, I'm a, I'm huge on volume. Volume, I say volume doesn't lie. Volume tells the truth. And when I see symbols coming through this alert, doing, well, in this case, almost 38 times one minute volume, 14 times five minute volume, um, it just means the world to me, and especially if I see them breaking out of a range. So, David, if you could right click on that window and click on configure. <coughs> uh, I'm sorry, configure and then go over to, I'm sorry, strategy, go to extreme volume and go to configure. All right, and go to window specific filters. This is a, no, this is a high alert. I'm looking for stocks that are hitting highs. And can you click on that window for me, the window specific filters? There you go, perfect. All right, so I'm looking for stocks. I do mostly swing trading now. So, okay, so I'm looking for <coughs> liquid stocks, stocks above $5. I'm looking for stocks over $5. They have to be doing 10 times normal one minute volume. And you don't see it here, but trust me, it's five times normal five minute volume. But what's really powerful about our software is we have so many position and range filters. So I like to tell people, guys, if you can imagine it, we can build it. And it's just incredible. If you can imagine a chart in your head, we can develop an alert for you. And in this case, I only want to see stocks that are about to break out of a 10-day range or a 20-day range. So I put these parameters in my um, filter here, and now I am not getting stocks just shooting up on huge volume, but they're in no man's land, okay? They're actually breaking out of a range. So now I have stocks that are breaking out of a range, and they're doing it on huge volume. So I don't have a whole lot of time here, but I do want to give you a, a little stock tip, so to say, for today. No, something that I found on this scanner this morning that I could think could be in for a multi-day or multi-month move. And if you will right-click on that scan and go to uh, history and put it on time frame and just put a zero where it says now, David, uh, and then hit OK. I'm sorry, OK at the bottom there? No, just, there we go. All right, let's scroll down. Cree is one of them that I think you should really keep an eye on. If you double click on Cree right here, this is one. It's an incredible move. Looks like it's getting away. You know, the train is leaving the station. But when I have that kind of confirmation of volume, that is just huge for me, you know? So, but the one I wanted to point out, if you'll scroll down, David, you'll see it on here. Just stop when you come to IBM. Just keep going there. Let's keep going. There you go. Just click on IBM. Okay, this is one. Now, granted, it's going to be up about 9% today. The majority of traders, when they see this kind of move, and a lot of fund managers will say, darn, I missed the move. This was just, a, you know, I wish I'd have been in it. I don't buy that. I think this has the potential to be in for a huge, it's been in the doldrums for a while, but keep an eye on IBM. I think this is one that could be in for a, a huge move. You know, maybe coming back to, you know, potentially all-time highs again. If I were to trade something like this, I do not want it to come back, you know, below this candle. But anyway, that's the kind of a, a little pointer I want to give you. Keep an eye on IBM. It's earnings, right? The day after earnings, huge volume. Just doing, when you see stocks as big as IBM doing 14 times one-minute volume, 12 times five-minute volume, boy, that's just a, that's, that tells me a lot right there. So keep an eye on keep an eye on IBM. Did you have a question? Yes. Oh, we got, we got. Um, when you said uh, a time point of volume, is that a rolling average of the previous you know, 61 cars or? No, very good question. That uh, uh, the developers, I think, uh, on the one minute volume, I would assume it. Uh, I think it goes back probably the one minute average over like a three or four day period. Five minute would probably be more of like a seven or eight minute period. I mean, seven, seven or eight day period. Eight days. Eight days. Eight days of five, five minute time frames. Okay. So yeah. So when you see that, uh, when you see that exploding, doing 14 times five minute volume, you know, it's not all day traders. There is some serious money going into IBM today. Okay. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you, Andy. Uh -huh. So, thank you, Andy. Uh -huh.
we can't say we haven't given you something. There's two stock ideas from Andy right here, and uh, you'll have to see him. Uh, but th this is, again, this is a little bit, I wanted to show the technology uh, as it exists on the desktop. Um, the experience is very much kind of choosing from a, a Netflix, if you will, kind of assortment of channels that we present to uh, the advisor or to the user. And clicking on those channels brings up the motif for that channel. So we have a social media channel, we have a pre-market channel, and quite obviously we have a, an AI channel. And this is, the, this is the wealth channel. So this is our product for advisors um, and as well as the sell side as well. Um, in this wealth channel, we have the portfolio of the fund manager or the advisor and, and, uh, and their clients incorporated as a symbol list that, this, that the technology is looking at. And then, as we showed with Andy's charts, we have usually a 15-minute and a daily chart to kind of show uh, the pattern that the stocks are in. And what it allows a, an advisor to do is to take the client's portfolio and to set certain price targets and limits, either set by trade ideas or that can be also set by the advisor. And in the course of the day or month or weeks, if any of those, if any of those price thresholds are met by the system or by the advisor, then they appear in, a, in a, this window here where you have a reason for making a phone call. You have a reason for kind of understanding what thresholds are being met either as a stop or as a profit target um, within the client's portfolio. Um, let's see, right? And then let me show you just a little bit of the AI and what it's doing today. So uh, today is a good day. It started off instantly. What I'm looking at, by the way, this is the Holly, this is the, the system we call Holly, and you have your the top row is again a five minute, a daily chart, and always what the S and P is doing on the far right. And the second row of information is the data around the daily regime of algorithms, as I mentioned, with instantly a kind of look as to how is it performing today, represented by this P&L chart. So of the trades that it's making, it is up today. It started off up, and then in the early morning session was down, and it's recently kind of clicked over to, to a positive. At the bottom of this graph, we have a risk on and risk off flag. And as I mentioned, the real time analysis that the AI is doing is always this com conversation of how is the market reacting today compared to how it's prepared for it. And it is doing, it's in a risk off mode. It <coughs> suggests, again, do not leave risk on the table. Be more alert to uh, movements in the market. Don't let a profit turn into a loss just because certain thresholds aren't aren't achieved, and that's in its more conservative mode for the day. This bottom section is the open positions on the right and the closed positions that it's already made to date. So it's traded twice uh, so far today. Both of them have been long, and by the way, the, the regime of algorithms, as I mentioned, was, I think there were seven, so there are five long and two short, and each of them come with the analytics as to, there's more columns on here I could show, but they come with what's the win rate of this algorithm coming to today, and what is the, what's the preferred time in position, the profit target for each of these ideas, the stop loss that it's going to employ, and the number of trades that it's already made today. So there has been a total of five trades that the AI has made, and that comes from the, the long strategies, these top three long strategies. There are some algorithms that are never that are never used, but that it's prepared to look at the market. And that's what the zero represents in this number of trades traded today. So let's see, in its closed, in the open, there are three open positions right now in UVV, TIER, and sometimes you can see a theme as to what sectors it happens to be in. I don't see a particular theme from this small number of, of trades so far. but. Again, this is more, this is again the experience of using the AI, seeing its results on the chart as to where the profit target and the stop losses are, and knowing where this trade is, is started. And so as an advisor, you could take this idea, you could set your own price limit farther beyond or below what the thresholds that the AI has set, and you can be alerted to those whether it happens a week from now or a month from now or a day from now. Okay? That's the experience. Let me, um, let me make sure I've gotten all the points I wanted to convey. 
from the presentation. And David, just note that's real time. That's that's actually live right now, real time as we sit here. Uh, that's what the AI is doing. It is actually looking at the market, it is determining of those uh, algorithms. It, and what it does is it actually is scanning all exchanges in real time as we sit here. And whatever it finds that uh, it hears from one of those algorithm formulas, it signals uh, on that uh, open order. Okay. As I come across um, other fintech companies and, and uh, some of our clients and our partners, um, this, is some, this is part of the message I kind of convey, and that is that we're in this new era. These tools are, and we're not going back, these are tools that are going to be ever more present in the market. Um, I like to also quote a gentleman, you know, Paul Tudor Jones, who said, you know, no man can beat a machine, but no machine can beat a man plus a machine. And that's the kind of model that we use where as much as there's the possibility to automate the kind of trades that come through the artificial intelligence we have, it is still meant to be, it, as a virtual analyst, it's meant to input into a, an investment decision committee's process or even the individual's uh, process as to how am I going to take this trade. This, this intelligence has given me the parameters, the guardrails for making a confident decision and knowing where things will go wrong. if they go wrong or where they go right. But then it's left up to, to you to actually engage the market with that plan, right? We'll talk a little bit, a little bit more, our sponsor, Interactive Brokers, we do have a unique relationship where using their execution API, you can automate the trades that Holly produces. And uh, Craig can talk a little bit about that at the end of, the, at the end of our set time together. But this, this is important because this is, uh, you know, as we said, it's table stakes now. And again, so some of our partners are, you know, are, we work with the NASDAQ, we were on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange um, and used by the New York Stock Exchange for the content that we create. And we have a, a number of, as I said, small hedge funds and uh, sell side agencies like Knight Capital uh, who use the technology to, to inform them. There are uh, wealth management offices of Merrill Lynch who use trade ideas as again, as a, as a virtual analyst and input into an investment decision. These ideas and some of the uh, analysis that, and the ways that Andy trades are very much intraday uh, and, and or swing, but that's one aspect of using the tool. Other aspects include a longer look of, especially a position like Andy showed in IBM, that portend a longer hold or more a, a, an opportunity across a larger time frame. And that, all that can be inputted within the system via price alerts uh, and, and such. So. Again, that's all I, does anybody have any questions? Yes. You were showing Holly earlier. Um, again, you had five, three open positions and two close. There, it's just, that's all it really has going on in, at one time? It, it, I mean, on a typical day, you can trade as many as 20, 20 times for the day. It can trade as little as, you know, zero to three or four or five. Um, but uh, there is no, you know, if it sees opportunity, it will continually put on, uh, put on those trades, uh, put on those positions. And um, what's also interesting is that the very, there's a good portion of our, of our subscription, of our clients, who don't necessarily care about, be, th let's face it, you either have the capacity to be at your computer the whole day to see what Holly's doing when it happens. Some people don't have that cap capability. So what so what others interact with our system do is they look simply, what were the trades from yesterday? And might those ideas that were put on yesterday by this intelligence still have merit today? You betcha. So um, they almost kind of ignore what's happening today, but they'll look at, well, this is what happened yesterday, and this is what happened the day before, and I can start to see the patterns you know, that it's looking at and either follow on those ideas, setting price targets so that I can be a, you know, made aware of them on my time frame, as opposed to being locked in and, and we've seen all sorts. We have some who are, they'll take the, the recent college grad who's more maybe tech savvy and have him in front of the machine or her in front of the machine and say, your job is to simply tell us what, you know, uh, what, what this AI is doing. Um, and if so, bring us the best ideas from it. So it's a range of, again, how, uh, 
how each firm interacts with the technology. It's fascinating to see. Maybe I missed it, but um, perhaps if I missed it, you just circle back around to it. Sure. How are we able to use this? Are we able to use it from a white label standpoint? Are we competing against you? Are you doing it yourself? Clients get access to it themselves, or can we you know, white label it as if though it's, it's, it's part of our own practice? We, we, we've done white labeling in the past, but it's, you know, because we're AI as a service, if you subscribe, we, we provide, uh, and by the way, the, the, the professional version of our technology is to the tune of $6,000 a year to receive this kind of uh, uh, analysis. What we fashion them in our price, one of our price anchors is, you know, and Larry Fink talked about this as well, I think gone are the days where you can have a Bloomberg terminal and kind of sit and say, okay, I understand the markets now. And most people from the, re I mean, we've been at this for 14 years, uh, pr even previous to the AI, which was when we launched it, is um, I love talking to people who use a Bloomberg terminal, for example, because they only wind up using maybe 10% and they pay a lot of money to let that other 90% just kind of be their monthly cost. Um, and we're not the only kind of Bloomberg terminal killer out there uh, who's providing data and information. But um, we're certainly one of the ones that, that is using more of these advanced modeling and techniques. So to your question about whether we're white modeling it, and then maybe I can also get into, is your question also in the sense of if you're giving one idea to one person, how, how is it? In other words, let's say I built a platform. And I want AI as part of my platform. Okay. You all have the AI. I have the other platform. Um, Am I just going to bring my clients in through my platform, make mention to you all as my AI service, right? and then trade through you all? How, explain how, how we're going to get from start to go, or go to end, or execution. Right. So, Thomas, I'll maybe want you to, to kind of defer a little bit to, to you, but it's a great question. Um, we've seen people either acknowledge that they're using trade ideas, and will use the, 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 the cachet of, this is artificial intelligence, and we've had others who don't who, who mute the, uh, the the whole ingredient, if you will, into their service offering. Um, they simply recognize that they will use trade ideas. Is that you know, as as Hugh had mentioned and as Andy mentioned, is this kind of you know wheat grass shot to their smoothie to to their offering that they're giving their clients, and to say, depending on your your individual client's risk tolerance, you'll be exposed to a portion of the overall portfolio to these AI ideas and whether they announce it that it's powered by trade ideas or whether they mute it as part of their overall service, it's really an individual uh, practice choice. I can, for instance, Merrill Lynch doesn't mention that it's trade ideas. Right, but they use it. But they, but okay. they're, yes, they use it. Tom, sure, yeah, a couple. No. And, and just to take off on your question, so I started using trade ideas in um, April of 2016 uh, I had a group of clients that were just simply not happy with what was going on in the world markets. Um, we decided to take a, a piece of that portfolio, call it 5 or 10%, and apply it to these types of ideas. And so I've been doing this now since that day. And um, what I find is I find that this tool allows me as an advisor to come to the table with ideas that otherwise wouldn't have, wouldn't have been you know, available to me, right? So if I'm using predominantly a lot of managed money with my clients, then one of the ways that I deliver value to that relationship, and we have to deliver value almost every day, uh, one of the ways that I deliver value is to you know, incorporate these ideas into that portfolio. So if, if you think about that core portfolio being managed money, then I'm going to satellite that with a few ideas, either on the alpha side for, you know, for growth, if it's a growth-oriented investor, if it's a retiree, I'm going to look more on the yield side. Uh, you, know, you know, Andy's been instrumental, and I work with Andy quite a bit um, to, to help me uncover ideas, uh, especially for my retirees who are looking to augment their retirement income. And he was instrumental in being able to craft very quickly one of those filters to help me identify great yield opportunities. And more importantly, where in that cycle, where in that 52-week range is that potential yield opportunity because as you can imagine what I want to do is I want to try to buy it at the lower end of that range pick up a good yield and then allow it to do what it does over time right and if I can continuously do that using this software then 
at the end of the day, what does that mean for me? That means more referral business, that means you know, more assets under management, so on and so forth. Uh, so the question, the question is, you know, how long am I holding these, uh, in, these ideas in my client's portfolio? And, and, you know, part of the answer to that is, you know, it depends upon the client's, obviously, their time frame. But what I have, what I have found, you know, even though what you're seeing here today is, is really geared in that intraday trading regime, no, no question about that, what we have found, what I have found and others have found is that if I can take these ideas in some cases, I'm finding excellent opportunities to find it at the right point and hold it for what it, it could be weeks, it could be months, uh, but I'm finding that this tool is a great identifier uh, of opportunities that we can hold for weeks or months even. Uh, and so it, it really has just depended upon both the client situation, the client's time frame, as well as where we were able to find it. Just to pick up on that, Eric, that was a great question. We, we do an analysis that we'll look at. If you follow the trading plan exactly in a risk-off mode, uh, you'd have a return of X. And if you went beyond in the risk-on mode, um, where, how much more would you, would you, would you potentially make or, or lose? And what we find is, especially with our trades of the week, the, the ones that we send out, we, don't can, we, we have a stop loss and a, and a, a, stop loss and a profit target. And we have a rule that says if there's a correction on a profit more than 20 percent it's time to kind of end position and that's a general rule that we have as part of that weekly you know, idea but it's still in the hands of every individual which is why maybe I thought Hakeem's question was going to skirt on this I often get the question that look your AI is a service right you're not just for fund investors you'll give this to anybody and if anybody and everybody starts using it right. won't there be a kind of you know, won't it all be arbitraged away? That's well, my first response is, that's a wonderful position to be in. I hope one day we get there. But even when we get there, that's not necessarily going to be the case because, because of this aspect that it's not doing the trading for you okay. uh, throughout the life of the trade. And if I gave everyone a recipe for, you know, the salmon dish we're going to have today, we'd have maybe three that came out with salmon. We'd have four fruit salads. We, we would have something completely different out of everybody making that, trying to make that same dish or follow that recipe. Some people won't, some people will, some people will come up with something altogether. And it's that beauty, I guess, or that, that diverse uh, in terms of the number of outcomes, regardless of what we, the, the, all that we do is we provide this guidelines for making a decision. And in life, it's often good to know when you're on the path, and it's equally important to know when you go off the path. What's hardest is when you're just in a fog. We try to lift that fog. And, you know, and you heard David mention earlier in the presentation uh, that the New York Stock Exchange uses this product. So I actually had a chance to be with David up in New York a, a few weeks ago. We were actually on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange visiting with the, one of the floor governors and one of the employees. And we, we simply were there to, to help them configure the software, but, you know, had a chance to ask them, so wh why are you using this? And, and so the simple reply was that, look, you know, we're getting calls from the CEOs of these companies on a regular basis, especially when price activity either goes outside the norm or some, some event happens, right? And so what happens? Well, they get a call from that CEO and says, why is my stock doing this? Those guys immediately go to trade ideas on their screen and they look at a particular, Andy, can you pull that up? I don't know if you can pull that up. They go up to a particular window called the derived data stream. They've got 850 stocks that they keep up with input it into that system and they can immediately go to that stock and say okay this is why this is why the stock's doing what it's doing and then they can turn around and talk to that CEO and say this is why it's happening this is what's going on in real time and I, I found that to be particularly impactful I, I, had, I had only learned about this just a few months ago but when I realized that you know arguably the, one of the most important exchanges in the world is using trade ideas to help inform CEOs in the executive C-suite about their stock, that, that meant something to me. Absolutely meant something to me. And, and so now I, I, have the same, I have the same data as the guys on the floor, right? In real time, instantaneously, and I can see the same thing they see, right? 
And that's, that's what gives me a lot of confidence in, in using this. Um, again, I mean, you know, I, I started trading in 1983. And back then, you know, individual investors made up a significant part of the daily volume of the, of the exchanges. Today, that's no longer the case, right? Over 60% of the volume is, is either high frequency traders or computer to computer algorithmic functioning. And if that's the case, then I want to be able to look my client and my prospect in the eye and say, I use AI as a part of my process. With all the competition out here today and all the press around robo-advising, I can look my client in the face and say, yes, this is a part of my process as a financial advisor to you as my client. And I can tell you, and you all probably don't need me to, to go any further, you understand the dynamic there, right? Especially our, our younger prospects, right? Especially the, you know, the millennial types and, and those who are very, very tech savvy. So um, I'm finding it to be a very useful tool. Uh, it, it's actually giving me an edge, if you will, as it relates to coming to the table with ideas. And, and you know, I can either, I can use the fundamental research that we've all been accustomed to over these decades and combine it with, you know, because of, you know, because of the market structure today, which is so computer oriented, technical analysis, good, bad, right or wrong, technical analysis is now critical in that decision making process. And I've got a tool See, I don't, I don't have to be the expert, right? I don't have to, I, I've got a tool now that allows me to, in, in real time, have a conversation with that client around that portfolio. And then if I get a real, you know, if I, you know, as, as David said, sometimes you get an engineer type to deal with, right? And I can pick up the phone and I can talk to Andy or any of the other staff at Trade Ideas to either come up with, you know, a, additional answers around that question or I'll even just, pick up the phone and talk to him time to time and say, T tell me where, you know, what is your thinking around where we are in the current cycle? And where do you see are the opportunities? One, one such example came up where, you know, look, we, we've been reaching new highs every other month, right, in the markets. Think about this. Think about guys like Jim Chanos, right, the, the most famous short seller of all, Jim, Jim Chanos. Well, what happens when we reach new all-time highs? Well, those guys tend to get a little nervous, and what will they do? They will start to close out that position. So Andy and his team came up with a filter that identifies all the what we call low float stocks that have a high short interest. And from that one screen, we have been able to uncover some phenomenal opportunities to pick up stocks that are being, you know, what we call squeezed, the short squeeze, right? Weight Watchers, if you saw on the trade of the week screen a few slides ago, Trade of the week was exactly one of those uh, stocks, and it's gone, you know, <laughs> exponential. And it's because, again, you know, the, the, what do you call it, the Oprah effect or whatever you want to call it. But the point is, is that those shorts got started getting nervous. They were closing that position, and we were able to capture that right as it was moving up. And it's been a, it's been a great investment. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Thomas. Um, we currently have over 430,000 uh, accounts. Uh, we have over $120 billion in deposits. Uh, we're a public company. Uh, we compete with some of the larger uh, company names that you're familiar with, Schwab, E-Trade, TD Ameritrade. Uh, we have a great uh, product that we offer for advisors, uh, for emerging advisors as well as established ones. Um, advisors on our platform get to keep 100% of their uh, management fee. The only way that we make our money is through execution, stock loan, and margin lending. Our product is uh, no cost. That includes a CRM, um, all our technology. Um, we have uh, portfolio analyst software. We, we offer international products. Uh, we make availability to over 100 different markets worldwide. And um, basically, we are low cost in a sense that we don't have ticket charges. Uh, we don't have that 495 per trade, 695, 985, whatever you have it. We are a, uh, we start out at half a penny per share for stocks and ETFs, 70 cents a contract for options plus exchange fees. And one of the key features that we offer is uh, block allocation. So you can allocate one trade to multiple clients without any ticket charges. Uh, example that I like to give is if you have five clients and you want to buy, say, Apple, 1,000 shares of Apple, you put on a, tra uh, a, a trade, you execute, uh, it's $5 for the trade. 
if you allocated 200 shares to each client, each client's only paying a dollar. So that's it, there's no, the minimum trade's a dollar, uh, it's half a penny per share, so it's 200 shares. Anything below that is still gonna be a dollar. Uh, we're a la carte, so we don't give away market data, we don't give away research. What we do offer is direct market access. Uh, we don't sell your order flow, we never compete with your order, um, and you can see that in our 606 report. Um, we just cracked 20 billion dollars today in market cap on our public company. We had earnings uh, yesterday, so um, we're growing uh, leaps and bounds. Uh, if you guys have any interest in the product, uh, I can show you a demo over there at that notebook computer, uh, and some of my information is up here. I'll pass around some cards, um, but we have clients that have, uh, you know, we have um, advisors with 10 clients, and we have advisors with 800 clients. We have a, uh, a program called three-tiered architecture where you have a, either a hybrid RIA and a broker-dealer, uh, and then they have uh, reps underneath them, or advisor over advisor. So you can have an established RIA, and then you can bring on reps as well. Uh, they can bring on their clients under you, so long as they have their 65. Uh, we also have a compliance company called Greenwich Compliance that'll help you get started if you want to go independent. So, uh, I mean, we're, uh, we're full service. Uh, we do have, um, we, we, f we focus on automation primarily, and we try to teach the advisors and our clients how to use the tools, uh, but we're always there for you, 24-7 uh, support. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Greg.